Welcome back to the second segment of Ajkir Alapan. Um, I'm your host, Abul Hasnat, and I've been speaking with um, Ken Ford Powell about his time in Bangladesh, about who is Ken Ford Powell and his influences in Bangladesh. And hopefully we're going to be looking at some of the stuff that he's doing and, and, and will be doing shortly, including his writing. So, Ken, let's go straight back into it um, sure. without uh, taking a break in our conversation because <laughs> we... We, we, we journeyed through your time in, in the UK and sort of your mm -hmm. initial perspective of, let, 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 let's, let, let's not only put it down to Asians, but I mean foreigners in general. But yeah. since then, your move to Bangladesh now, I mean, you had several trips, but your biggest move was, was, was the start of a five-year period out there. It was, yeah. Tell us all about it. So, yeah, after, you know, two or three trips out there as a family, uh, my children were, were, were very young at the time. Um, we kind of really kind of decided as a, as a unit that we, we wanted to live in Bangladesh uh, and that the kind of work that needed to be done out there was, was important um, and it was, I was, I eventually I was ready to leave that classroom as I mentioned in, in mm. Cumbria. So we moved out there in 2008. We spent three interesting months in Dhaka doing language training. Uh, Dhaka, as you can imagine, was kind of, that was really mind-blowing <laughs> from, yeah. from our point of view. But after that, by December of 2008, we were up in Dinajpur, uh, up in, uh, at the, the LAM NGO in our um, building there, and uh, settling in. Uh, just, just for the purpose of the audience, or for those that shame when you don't know the geography of Bangladesh, tell us a bit about where Dinajpur is in Bangladesh. So the Dinajpur area is right up in the northwest. It's very close to the Indian border, not too far away from heading off into um, uh, the Darjeeling part of India and the Himalayas up in, in that direction. I'm, I'm told reliably that you can see the Himalayas from where we were at the NGO, but I never saw it in five years there. It was always too misty. <laughs> but I'm told it with, that we were that close. So yeah, very close to the Indian border. So as a result, there are a lot of uh, Hindus in that area, a lot of Santali tribal people there. Um, so it's quite a mix of Muslims, Christians and Hindus in, in that particular kind of area. And uh, one of the things about that whole northwest area is that it was very much cut off by the Jamuna ri River coming straight down um, and then the, um, uh, the Mega River coming underneath. And that kind of really cut that whole segment off. And as a result, it was very undeveloped until the Jamuna River was famously built across there, one of the longest rivers in Asia, I believe. Um, and that kind of changed bridge, everything. Yeah. yeah, the bridge enabled mm. trade to, and transport to really kind of like take off. And so the area's been growing ever since. But that was the reason why uh, the LAM was set up there about 40 years ago, uh, because it was just a very, very poor area. There were a lot of rural village people there with not an awful lot of medical care going on. Uh, and it was just the perfect place to set up an NGO and really be able to, to, to serve people who needed help most. So yes, yeah, so that's, that's the, the area. Um, and it's very beautiful, mm. um, but also there wasn't an awful lot to do either. So. I mean, just, just, just to sort of compare the differences, in, in that short time of yours between Dhaka uh, and Dinajpur, I, I mean, I'm going to call it Dinajpur, although you were a good... Um, a good hour away from yeah, Dinajpur itself, yeah. Away, yeah. Like, I mean, it, yeah, you're right. I mean, to say that it was actually cut off, um, similar to, if, I mean, the, the geographs out there might consider Alaska um, a sort of similar sort of <laughs> cut off, if, if, if it helps. But, um, I yes, mean... A very yeah, hot talking, Alaska. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, it's... Um, it's really interesting that they were so far behind, um, considering we're well I you were well into the 21st century. Um, I mean, well into the 21st century. Um, and I mean, you, I don't know if you had the opportunity to compare it to places like Sillet and Chittagong, which are a lot more, which were a lot more developed by then. Yeah, a little bit. I've been, I went to the Sillet region once, went to Sri Mongol, uh, mm. just uh, I think it was in 2009. And I've been down to Rangamati in the Chittagong area down there. Uh, once or twice as well, which uh, is, you know, which has been very good. And I've done Kulna as well fairly recently too to see how that is. And yeah, I think it was it, it is quite undeveloped. Uh, I mean, to put it into perspective, uh, when we first started going out there, there was no internet of any sort whatsoever. 
Uh, I think it was on our second trip before we went out there to live that we actually spent some time with a friend in Dhaka searching the phone shops because there had been rumours that there was a certain phone that had a modem that it could be attached to your laptop to connect you to the internet and it was just a kind of a rumour uh, and this phone was eventually found um, and bought and, got, and bought back and I remember that people were forever borrowing this one phone just so that it could be linked up to, to uh, wow. the internet because the alternative was really to write, an e write emails on one single computer and I believe that kind of li literally the emails were kind of collected up and somebody shot off to Dinajpo itself and went to a computer place there to download the emails and send them all off and they, this is how it worked. That's how basic it was. Mm. Now um, we keep in touch with our friends and people we consider our family in villages which are literally made of straw and mud and we Skype them uh, <laughs> from their mobile phones and from our iPads and things like that um, and the connection is brilliant we're able to talk to them we're able to see them you know uh, and they're still living in this kind of you know incredible rural background where they're you know uh, they're keeping uh, goats and cows and uh, pigs and all this kind of stuff you know all around and every time the the, the rainy season comes the the roofs are destroyed the houses start to fall down and they've got to build it up and yet they've got their mobile phones and able to connect on Facebook amazing what a change over in just the last 10 years alone yeah brilliant um, I mean I'm lost for words saying that <laughs> because it's a it's, it's it's an amazing thing now because um the way the way that's just moved mm. forward um, let's let's move on to I mean your your teaching there now because a huge huge contrast to where you were coming from yeah thirty thirty pretty much British most 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 likely white British predominantly kids. white yep. um, students to going to thirty Bangladeshi very likely all if if, if not all poor background and maybe Definitely. little enthusiasm on learning just just something that they need to get out of the way I mean. Well, Tell us about do you that. know, funnily enough, I would say that with that attitude, it was more akin to the students I was teaching in England. <laughs> uh, it was one of the reasons why I went in the end, you know, yeah. that uh, the attitude to, to learning in this country was very much taken for granted. We've all got education, we've all got schools, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we all suffer, you know, the, the dreadful chemistry teacher or whatever, and who cares? I just want to get out of school. That kind of attitude is, is still very, very strong, I think, in this culture. Over there, there was a, a, a real difference. Mm. I think firstly driven by the parents who of course were just one generation out from 1971, the, the War of Independence, you yes. know, seeing the country absolutely devastated, um, having been ravaged in many ways for many decades if not centuries beforehand. Um, and they were very, I think the parents were just very aware this was an, a, a, a golden opportunity for their children to be able to really develop and, and come out of poverty. So there was great support from the parents, but the kids themselves as well were just beautiful. They were just lovely attitudes, very respectful, they enjoyed your company, you could, you could play with them in the playground and you know there wasn't a sense of us and them which has become very much the stereotype of, of British teaching that you know and that hasn't been helped by uh, you know the, the kind of current um, paedophilia paranoia that we have in this country at the moment that everything's got to be very distant and professional and very clinical over there you can just have fun with the kids you can you know, share a laugh and, and get on with the teaching and know that they're going to get on with doing the learning uh, and I was so impressed by these kids I mean some of them were literally going home to their villages literally living in a mud hut with the power cut off because the there's not enough electricity in, in Bangladesh mm. and they're doing the homework by candlelight in a mud hut you know you know sometimes it's raining dead. and the mud huts collapsing down or what around them or whatever and they're doing their chemistry homework or the maths homework for you mm. that is such dedication uh, I, you know and I just I took my hat off to them really it was they, they were just wonderful kids and I had five fantastic years teaching them um, and uh, they're, they're, again they're, they're the real heroes as far as I'm concerned. I mean it, it, it's it's something I notice as well when I go to Bangladesh I mean the Bangladeshi, the, the, the nationals, the na natives themselves, they're, they're very warming to Bidishi and oh, I, do yeah. you think that played a role in actually you enjoying your time and maybe the kids, those kids actually enjoying learning from you compared to their, um, the normal teachers? 
Well, I think the, the NGO was, was a real blessing for them in many ways because they'd seen many people from many different cultures going there. It wasn't, you know, just British like myself. We had Americans, Canadians, Koreans, uh, Japanese, uh, you know, people from all over the world that, that were uh, coming along and doing various things, either working with the, the hospital or in the rehab or in the school or whatever. So these kids benefited from seeing a lot of people from a lot of different cultures and seeing us all as being very much equals uh, with each other. Mm. So I think they, they got a lot from that. And I think, yeah, uh, us Badeshis kind of influenced them to a certain extent. They certainly influenced us. I mean, my, my life was changed by being in Bangladesh. And I al always say Bangladesh did a lot more for me than I ever did uh, being out there myself. Mm. Um, but I think uh, one of the, the nice things is that they, they've kind of grown up with a belief of, a, of equality of all. Uh, and that if you kind of, you're ready to put the work in and be honest and caring about other people, then you can make it in this world. And many of them have. I mean, we, you know, I say this, the school has been running for 15 years or so, something like that. And we've got people who have gone off to go and do degrees and they've come back and they're giving, they're now giving back into that area. Wow. Um, having been, you know, little boys and girls themselves, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago or so. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I mean, the influence of that, they've gone out, they've got themselves a very nice, uh, you know, uh, over their degrees, are, they, mm. they really compete for them. And, the, uh, and lo and behold, they've come all their background and they want to come back to yeah, the same Yeah, many village. of them do, definitely. Yeah. I, I, I have to ask because you, you surely, through your many years that you taught there, shared many st stories with them of your time <laughs> in England. Yes. And... The reactions, what sort of reactions did you get when you shared stories about, and, and maybe you had some really obscure questioning, which you'd never expect a British uh, student to question you or ask that, such a question. I mean, you must have had such um, these sort of experiences. Um, I did. I, I, it was very fun, kind of like seeing the, the, the mix of cultures, and we were always able to have a good laugh. I, I've always enjoyed kind of uh, making the classroom a, a fun environment. Um, and there were some things that, uh, that always, uh, uh, always a little bit different. Uh, I, I'm very British, so I'd use a lot of British colloquialisms, and they'd kind of sometimes be saying, you know, Uncle Ken, what? What, what, did, what did you just say there, you know? Um, and uh, I, I, I will confess that probably the naughtiest thing I did out there was introducing some of my students to Faulty Towers. <laughs> and you, couldn't, you can't get more British in comedy than, than Faulty Towers. Absolutely. Well, and I didn't think they'd get it. Uh, I, I thought that it wouldn't be the same kind of humour. Well, they absolutely loved the, the episodes I showed. They, they thought it was, it was hilarious. And I was really pleased about that. And I think that might have been the beginning of me realising that we are, we are living in a global village. That we may come from different cultures, we may come from different backgrounds, we may have different religions, we may have different kind of even kind of different different uh, ethical or political viewpoints. But you know, as the famous expression says, if you cut me, I bleed the same colour blood as you. You know, uh, and we're all one people. And really, in a sense, it's just a if you learn the language, and I don't necessarily mean literally the language, but the kind of the cultural language of things, you actually see that everybody's the same. Mm. You know, we laugh the same, we find the same kind of things funny, we, we find the same kind of things interesting, we care in the same way, we love in the same way. It's just the trappings, the, the how that is presented, how you, how you go forward with that. You know. um, I mean, um, we've got a couple of minutes before we go on a break, and I think that's what we spend time on focusing. Um, so just to give a sort of touch on that, the Global Village, I mean, when, when, when did this idea come, come about? And I mean, how did, I mean what's, what's got you, obviously your time in Bangladesh has got you more involved, but who have you gone out there and met since on, on this? And, and really seen other people that are, are, are grasping this idea of sort of promoting the Global Village? Well, I think really, uh, as I, I've said on my TEDx talk, that uh, we're, we're me coming from that kind of fearful background of uh, you know of other people and other cultures, and you know in particular, you know of course the the the, the Muslim community since 9/11, you know facing these kind of like uh, suspicions you know, a lot of the time, and. Um, when I went out there, I, I think I just saw so many people who were so accepting, so welcoming. I, I couldn't, I don't think I could point you to, to just individuals. Mm. I think actually just the nation, wherever I went, people were very welcoming and very caring. And I real, that was where I kind of really realized, actually, we are just 
one. We're all just human beings trying to make it mm -hmm. in, you know, every day and, and get get our way through, you know, through the day. I, I'll tell you what we do, Tim. Kent, hold it there. We're going to continue straight after this break. We need to go for a quick break. Come back to the final segment. We're talking about the Global Village now. See you in a moment.